I'm going to share something with y'all. That might put me in a very negative light, yeah. Relationships are not my forte. You see if someone grabbed up my wife for saying completely different ball game. I'll walk away from it and this has been like a therapy session. Hello and welcome to Raw, the Fight Within podcast with me, Coogan Cassius. This week, I am ecstatic and delighted to be joined by the maverick of uh, boxing media, journalism, just an all-round rock and roll star, really. Gareth Davies, A. Davies, how are you, first of all? I'm very well. What an intro. Thank you so much and thank you for um, taking the time to want to interview me for your podcast. It's an absolute honour and a privilege, Coogan. We uh, had a conversation away from camera about mine and your relationship, and I think one thing we, which was pretty apparent, shall we say, is the fact that I've known you for about 12 years, but I know nothing about you, and vice versa, which was weird but not weird, if that makes sense. I, I, I wouldn't say that you know nothing about me, and I wouldn't say I knew nothing about you, but what we do know about each other is generally it's in the milieu of fight weeks and fight sports. Um, I know we get on. We've had a couple of little bumps along the way. When I stole Wayne Rooney off you one day. That was um, the other day. That was the other day. It wasn't deliberate. And I was very apologetic for the next 10 times that I saw you. I've always had a good feeling about you. I think we're both workaholics in our industry. Um, and I think that's why when we are around each other, we're on. You have to be on in what we do. Um, it might sound weird, but you really do have to be on. And you find out, as you say, 10, 12 years that we've known each other, you find out in this industry whether you actually fit or not uh, over that period of time. Um, we haven't socialised with each other. We haven't met each other's families and done all that kind of thing. Generally, I think it, the, the reason is because when you're away from work, you're actually on your downtime and you actually have to spend time with your own families. Um, but, you know, you're a part of the furniture in the industry. I probably am as well now. People get used to you. I've, I've truthfully, and we were laughing about this last night, I've been around people in America for like 25 years, sat down for dinner, fight night dinners and fight week dinners, been around them in the media room. I don't even know what their names are. I've been around them for 25 years, sat next to them and talked to them for half an hour, an hour, three hours at a dinner. You don't even know what their names are. They're just faces within the industry that you work with. It sounds really weird, but we are involved in a fairly weird industry. I know a lot of people's names who I do socialize with. Um, but I'm not really that different, I would say, outside uh, the boxing industry. I'm very driven, very competitive, um, live life to the full, would call myself a hedonist, feel very privileged to do what I do, but I also feel a little bit of an underachiever. Um, I could have done so many other things, different things, um, but maybe I've alighted in this industry where probably feeling like a little bit of an outlaw in terms of, um, you know, an outsider where I think there's a lot of misfits in our industry, um, but happy maybe to be misfits eventually, if that makes any sense to you. Perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, ease you in gently before we go on, um, so to speak. Maybe we are going to socialise more now after this. I get a feeling we are. I think we are. Uh, that's a different story, though. Um, <laughs> Gareth, just, just kind of, yeah, like I said, ease you into this uh, conversation on here. What do you remember as your first ever memories of boxing as a, as a child or when you took notice of boxing growing up? Muhammad Ali was a hero. I was born in 65, so Muhammad Ali was a hero. Bruce Lee was a hero. So I've always liked martial arts and boxing. I remember when I was a little kid, I always used to beg my dad um, before I went away to boarding school. I'd have been probably eight, nine. If I could stay up and watch sports night on a Wednesday, 
I don't know if you're too young to I remember, remember Sports this. Night. Well, Sports Night was on. Boxing was always the last thing, and it was on like at 10, 30, 11 at night. And obviously, it was past my bedtime. But the boxing was always kept, probably water, something to do with the watershed at the time. And I used to beg my dad to let me step because it was so thrilling. Um, so those would be my first uh, memories. Um, you know, later on, I mean, I, I mean, we can come to this, but I, you know, I went to China and I studied martial arts for a year and after university and worked there and so on. Always had a fascination with 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 energy and how energy was used and warrior culture and and imperialism and I think it all relates. It's all, it's it's a very primeval and very. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sport of neuro tribes, in my view. You've got your hunters and your gatherers, and everybody involved in the fight industry and around the fight industry, and maybe in military and all those kind of things. For me, are, are, are belong to a neuro tribe that was the hunters in the beginning, that hunted the giant buffalo, probably 50 men and five women when we lived in giant cage, caves, and we had to kill two giant buffalo for the winter for the tribe. And everyone took their shabine or their drinks and went out at three in the morning, 50 men, five women, um, and hunted the giant buffalo because it's in you as a neuro tribe. And, and you, you'll recognise yourself that, that being involved in our industry is part of that tribe. I've always played sport. Um, I've always loved physicality. I wanted to be a pro cricketer at one point. Um, and I was pretty decent at cricket. I was decent at rugby. Um, you know, I've done tried lots of different martial arts down the years. Um, I don't think I'm naturally a fighter. I I, I need a reason. Like I I need a reason. You know. Um, but I I I think I've been this long in in the sport because you can't get like the other night at Yard and Better Beer. The energy you feel, you know, it's only 10,000 people in there, but the energy you feel when two men go to war like that is extraordinary. It just stays with you. I remember feeling exhausted afterwards. Um, and when you're in a big stadium and all the energy is beaming down and you're right in the centre of it, you can actually feel the energy of people. The noise, it carries you. And, and I'm very passionate about it. Um, and the narrative of fighters and their lives... Um, and, 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 you know, being an orator and being a communicator and being a linguist as I am, you know, I, I, I love the fact that I'm able to, to, to tell those stories and maybe even help fighters tell their own stories. Do you remember the first ever fight you went to? <sighs> I wish you told me that before I came and I could have just sifted through those memory banks. Um... Or one that sticks out. I think it was one of the travelling Gallagher's from Camden. Or maybe Colin Dunn. It's a York Hall fight, definitely the York Hall. Because I was writing, before I wrote for the Telegraph, I was running the sports desk on a Saturday at Agence France Press in Fleet Street. I was doing bits of writing for the Telegraph. This is, I'm talking 90, 1990, 91 now. Um, 32 years ago, I can't believe it sometimes. Um, and, I, and I was writing for the Highbury and Islington Express, which was sister paper or brother paper of the Hampstead and Highgate Express. So I was writing um, boxing for as well. And I was covering all the Islington fighters. Um, so I think it might have been... I don't know what fight it was but he, he was a tough guy Colin Dunn I still see him around Kentish Town when I'm in there and he was trained by Colin Lake who was a loony as well they were great guys um, Billy Schwer was around that time as well from he Luton was, from Luton was fighting yeah. there then but I, I reckon is it PJ Gallagher am I thinking of the right Gallagher there um, it was a Gallagher who, who, who lived in Camden in a little traveller site um, still see them around today, but it was York Hall and it was like a bear pit. Um, and I just, I think people were smoking in there at that time. Cigars at ringside and blood across your notebook. Literally blood across your notebook. I've had blood across my shirt before when you're sitting there ringside. And you dictated your copy at the time. It was a Wednesday night very often. It would have been a Wednesday night. And you get on the phone and you ad-libbed your copy, talking it into the phone. 
Um, and I remember sitting on the stairs. I think these are the very first recollections of covering it, sitting on the stairs at the York Hall, just you coming, you know, the stairs up to the balconies, and Colin Hart walking past of the sun and going, make it sing, son. You know, and you're sitting there like nine o'clock at night just speaking the copy in because you didn't have laptops at the time. You just spoke it into your phone. You asked the copy taker, uh, what, how many words are we up to? 400, and you're maybe doing a 600 word piece. And um, you, you find out whether you can do it or not. Hmm. You mentioned Muhammad Ali there. Was he the first boxer that kind of enticed you into the sport? Or was there my, someone before that? My, my father was working abroad, and there was American Forces television. I think it might have been in Berlin because he was definitely there in the 70s when Ali was having the fights. And I reckon his fights, we either listened to it on the radio, and I'd have been a little boy still, and I'm on the way to school at 10, to boarding school, and I think we were either watching it on British Forces, I'm not British, American Forces television, which they had, or we listened to it on the radio, but there was something thrilling about this man um, who just had the world at his feet, who, who was beautiful, who was wonderful, who was an orator, who was special. Um, you know, and, and, you know, my mum's family is Italian origin. My dad's from, you know, the Ronda Valley, a very tough area, mining area. But my mum and dad left the area when they were teenagers and went to work abroad. My dad's in the RF and then the Foreign Office. And I think my dad loved fight sports as well. He loves all sport, um, but loved fight sports as well. And there were lots of um, famous boxers from that area as well. Um, so I think there was something came through from my dad. Um, but I think Ali was such a big figure in the world when I was a little boy that he was like a superstar. He was... He, um, and... When you're little, you, you can't... I'm trying to take myself back to that age. And you don't... I can't, can't speak about things like I can today, you know, with, with you know, being a broadcaster and a, and a journalist now. But that, that, that he was a man who, who took your breath away. You know, he was special. Um, and I think the music of the time was quite big in, in the household as well. You know, Motown and my mum and dad were really into music. Um, as I am, um, and you know, I think uh, I can remember myself as a tiny baby, or you know, two, three years old, a young kid, sitting on the floor with music on in the kitchen all the time. You know, my mum always having music on, and Ali was part of that. Mm. When I look back and watch the the Rumble in the Jungle, for example, um, the, the the when we were kings. And I knew Leon Gass, the filmmaker. I was involved in a movie he made about Manny Pacquiao. Brilliant, brilliant man. Lunatic, absolute lunatic. He passed away last year. Um, lefty, lefty gassed. Loved his fight sports. That, that time when all those, those brilliant singers from America went to Africa, when it was first about to happen, Ali and, and Foreman, and then they left because of the cut to Foreman's eye. There's still a, there's a great movie about the, the concerts. I don't know if you've ever seen it. No. But it's so worth watching. All the stars of the time. So music, Ali, Ali, trying to think of who he, the equivalent of who he'd have been today. I think maybe Tyson Fury rolled into, who's the biggest acting star? Tyson Fury rolled into... I'm trying to think of the, the most famous kind of actor out there in Hollywood right now who's that ilk. Um, and maybe Morgan Freeman and Tyson Fury rolled into one, you know? That's how big I think he was in the world. Imagine if Muhammad Ali had been on social media, you know? He'd, he'd have had 200 million followers, you know? Maybe a billion followers. A bit of a maybe a difficult one for you to answer, but if, if you hadn't been so predominantly involved in the sport of boxing, as you have been over several decades, 
what do you think you would have been doing? Well, I was, I was brought up around the British services and then the Foreign Office. I might have gone into the Foreign Office. I had interviews to go into the Foreign Office. I could have been in a completely different direction. Um, if I hadn't had children early, I probably... I was always around growing up. I was always around. I was playing sport and then I was abroad. My parents worked in 18 different countries. I think it was city after city after city. I mean, I've gone on to work in... I think it's over 40 countries. I made a list in lockdown. 40 countries, over 100 cities... Um, you know, I've been to Vegas over a hundred times with boxing and MMA. I can't believe it. New York 50 times, but everywhere. And I still feel like there's so many places to visit. But I think I would have been um, probably in public service in some kind, but could easily have been a foreign correspondent. But I had kids very young, you know, like when I was 25. So that changed my outlook. Um... You know, I, I, I did a degree in Spanish and Italian, and then I did a master's in linguistics and journalism. Um, and I probably was headed towards... I'd met a lot of foreign correspondents. One of the first jobs I ever did was in Tiananmen Square in Beijing in 1989. I was out there. That's when I was living in China for a year after uni. And I did a lot of reporting at the time. It was my first reporting job. You know, you remember Beijing, Tiananmen Square and all of that? Um, I was all the way through that. Um, but I'd love to have been a foreign correspondent. In fact, even maybe 10, 12 years ago, I, I mean, I'm fluent in Spanish. I considered, and I did speak to the foreign editor of The Telegraph and wondered about going and being a stringer, as they call it, in South America, maybe in Argentina, um, in one of the Spanish-speaking countries, and being a stringer in South America, because I love the idea of having a country to report on. So, you know, boots on 3 a.m., um, earthquake, you know, disaster, murder story, uprising. I love all that. I, I really do. No, I really do. I mean, I was brought up around that. You know, my, my parents were in lots of troubled countries working. Um, I have great admiration for my parents. They're, 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 they're two of my closest friends. I'm very lucky how much my parents love me and, and have supported me in my life. And I'm closer to them as I get older. Um, but I think, I feel like an underachiever in lots of ways because I've stayed in this one industry. I'd like to have done more music as well. I mean, I'm learning the piano at the moment. I wish I'd started years ago. Um, but self-discovery pays dividends. I've got some some lines on my whiteboard at home in my kitchen. I've got big whiteboards with plans and all those kind of things. I've got several lines I try and follow as, as pillars of my belief system. And self-discovery definitely pays dividends. And, I, and as does being yourself. You reap what you sow. Treat others as you'd like to be treated yourself. Decisions determine your success and failure. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Um... But in what we do, you find out whether you can do it or not. Stamina pays, it plays a huge part in it as well. And, and passion for what you do. I still have a passion for this, that's why I do it. But I do feel like an underachiever in lots of ways. Feeling inside from out. I could have done so many more things. And I really do want to achieve so many more things. As a child, or into your teen years, do you remember the first ever altercation you were involved in, whether that be physical or verbal, something that sticks in your mind. I don't know whether at that age, because you, when I interview boxers, obviously there's an element of that as they was growing up, away from the ring. But for yourself, do you remember a point? I've got two, as a couple of, I, I was very competitive growing up. I'm still very competitive. Um, you know, and I was good at sport, you know, I, I was athletic, I went fat in my 30s and 40s and thankfully I, I'm exercising hard again now um, and got back to myself. After a heart attack, I hasten to add, um, and again, digressing slightly before I answer that, facing your own mortality in life is a very special thing. Once you've faced it, and everybody who has 
who's watching or listening to this knows that you value everything a bit more afterwards. You make the most of it afterwards because you have literally faced your own mortality. You knew you could have been gone. And we can be gone any time. It's a lottery ticket for all of us. Um, and it's part of the waking up. It's part of the wisdom of, of, of what life is. I got... There was a kid that wanted to f fight me in primary school. And I had boxing gloves. I was about eight or nine, maybe nine, maybe approaching ten. And we actually had a boxing match. I'm trying to remember his name. Was it someone Slee, his name was? He wanted to fight me. I don't know why. I didn't do anything. But you get that sometimes in life. People want to have a fight with you. There's, you know... Um, so I said, all right, well, I'll do it, but um, I want to make a boxing ring and I want to have a glove each to do it. And he was up for that and we did it. I think he beat the shit out of me. Um, but and there were loads of kids there watching and I used cricket wickets as the, as, as the square. Because I used to organise all the kids in the field opposite my house in the summer to come and play cricket all day. Um, literally all day. Um, every day in the summer. I was always organising kids. I was always outdoors, you know, when I was young. I just had to come home after it was dark. Do you remember those days? Of course. And, like, you never had a bottle of water. You, you could go to the quarry five miles away. This was how my parents were stationed in Lincolnshire at the time. And, like, we went miles. We went miles on our bikes. And I, I would literally organise 15 kids to play cricket all day. We'd have two teams. And we'd, so we did the boxing ring that day. There was another time... Um, when I was probably in the second year at boarding school and there's a guy called Simon Pro, but I loved Simon, he's dead now. He, um, he, he was a mixed race kid and, we, and he, was the la he was the last year in, the, in my boarding school of, I think there were scholarships for about 10 or 15 kids in the year who couldn't afford to come to the school, but the school through their arms trust, arms trust, paid for these kids to come in the school. Simon was the hardest kid in our year. I really liked Simon, but I locked him in a, in a cupboard in the lunch break once in our classroom as a joke. And he was banging on the door. He came out and he was livid and he was mixed race, light to mixed race. And I'd always got on with Simon. In, and, um, and, 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 and the, um, I'll, I'll just finish this story. Um, I locked him in the room, he came out, he was livid. He was white. Because it had scared him being locked in the cupboard. He was claustrophobic or whatever. He came out, he started smashing me in the face. Smash! I didn't feel a thing. I've got quite a high pain threshold. He was smashing me in the face. And I, I, there was like water coming out of my eyes. I grabbed hold of him. And then he grabbed hold of me. And he went, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Because he, 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 he'd come out and he'd smash it. I had no reason to. I was just sorry I'd upset him. So he smashed me a few times. I grabbed him, stop him hitting me. And he grabbed me even tighter, and he told me he loved me, and he was so sorry. And you know what? Simon, from that day onwards, would kill for me. It was so weird. We became really good buddies. Unfortunately, he's dead now. He lived in Bristol. He lived a wild life. Um, drugs and alcohol. He had big dreads. He was always at music festivals. Simon Probert, yeah. Um, I had a few other fights in the street when I was growing up. We used to be put, picked on in our school uniform by the... Um, but by the local kids, you know, the, 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 and who, who used to kind of beat up, you know, beat up the public school boys. Um, but I played a lot of rugby and stuff, and, and like, you know, I don't, you know, and I, I'm quite an aggressive person, um, and I need a reason. I need a reason. But I did a couple of times when people sat on me, I hit them first, and it's amazing when you hit someone first how they suddenly back down. Um, but you know, I, 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 I'm more into love and peace these days. You know, I'm, I'm into uh, commentating and observing on our fight industry. Gareth, talk to me about a time in your life where you felt as though you were fighting a losing battle. At whatever point in your life. <laughs> It's a weird one, really. I, I haven't, I haven't, because hope springs eternal for me anyway. So um, I don't have... Oh, yeah, there is, actually, there is. I think this... I, one is physical. You know, when you're young, 
you you have your health um you're busy with your time you know you're not particularly wealthy you're making your way in life you're bringing your children up when you and this is where where it's fascinating in our industry as well i'm not going to talk about that necessarily but boxers age it, for me, it's been the losing battle is when you lose those physical skills you had for a long time playing sports. And I'm thinking of myself as a cricketer, really, bowling or your speed. Um, that, there is a time when it leaves you. And a bit like if you're getting fatter and you don't notice it in the mirror because you're with yourself the whole time. It's the same with your physical decline. You will decline physically. You could be in amazing shape, but you will lose the tensile strength you once had, the fast twitch fibers. That's really hard to let go of. I've found, I've, you know, I often get asked, oh, I'll come back and play a game with the veterans. And like, nah, no, because you knew what you were. And, 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 it doesn't, and I'm not saying it in an egotistical way, but there was a time when you were fucking unbeatable you know, indefatigable, you know, um, and you knew, you knew what you could give, you know, um, and I didn't play a high level of sport, I played a decent high level of, of you know, league sports, and, you know, Saturday was fucking war, you know, I gave everything, and, you, and the guys I played with would pay testament to that, I'm not the biggest, I'm not the strongest, but mentally, you know, when you play sport, if you're strong, you're strong, you know you are. You know, and, and, and there's times when you have to carry people around you, make them believe, you know. And that's why I, 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 I love the, I love trying to delve into the psychology, um, not just the physiology of the, of the sport that we're involved in. Over the years, your knowledge on it increases. And that's why I, I truly believe that, that, that our fight in fight sports mentally, it's, it's, it's very important. I would say, um, in, later in life, I felt it a little bit more, and, and it caused a bit of depression in me, um, which I hadn't had until my, you know, 50s, late 40s, 50s, was, you know, um, the end of a very long marriage um, and divorce, very hard to deal with. Because when you've been with someone a long time, there's so many things that, that, you, that you are accustomed to so many habits and familiarity and boundaries are, uh, are, are not there anymore with, with the space you choose to share with that one person. And then apart from that, I would say after a heart attack um, or having the heart attack, f wondering physically whether you're capable anymore. And, you know, as I said earlier, facing your own mortality. But what I would say in all of those things, you grow again. And I do pass on the advice to other people, you know, that... It gets darker before it gets light very often in a difficult situation. And, but when, and the darker you go, the more bright the light is afterwards. Um, and it is time and it is actually working on yourself, self-discovery, as I say, paying dividends, delving into yourself, um, accepting the pain that you're going to feel at some point, like just accepting it, trying to live through it. Um, you know, and I have I've a lot of friends who going through similar things and you can pass on that advice. Believe in yourself, find the things that are core to you, follow them through and you will come out of it again and, and reach out to people. I've reached out to a few people um, when, when I know they've been low, um, fighters included, and always say to them, nothing to do with work here, by the way. It's about our relationship. If you need to talk to someone, because I'm a late owl, if you need to talk to someone late at night, ring me, yeah? Um, because at my age, I've had a lot of experiences, and if I can share anything that helps. I just had it yesterday with a friend in the industry, you know. Um, and, and I think that is part of going back to your original question about how well do you know someone. Sometimes we change or we, we evolve and you don't know that person that you've been with for 20 years or 30 years anymore. You don't know them. And I think it's just about being present in time and realising it, that, that life changes and you move on and the things that happen to you shape you. Um, 
you know, and hopefully for the better. But going through, going through difficulty is, is really important. It does definitely help you to learn. It helps you to evolve. It helps you to be challenged. I mean, I watched your interview with Ray Winston, who I think is a fascinating man. Um, and my mother hasn't been that well. And listening to him talking about his mother, how angry he was for two years, couldn't deal with things. It's made me, my mum lives out in the Mediterranean. It's made me book a flight. I'm going this weekend just for 40 hours because, you know, she hasn't been too well. And I'm thinking, no, this year, I don't want to see them twice in the year, my parents. I want to see them every six weeks. It's just so worth it. And I think even from him being open and talking about that, you can inspire other people through, through those things. Those are my difficult, difficult moments. What would you say for you, at the stage you are in your life, are the everyday battles for Gareth Davis? When you wake up in the morning, whether they be physical or mental, what are the everyday battles, if you have any? Oh, I have some physical ones, but I ride my bike almost every day. Um, you know, I'll do six, between six and sometimes 25 miles on my bike. I feel amazing when I'm out. I don't want to go home sometimes when I'm on them. So I, I build time into the day. Because if I don't do that, I don't feel right physically. Um, mentally, it's, it's about rigour and discipline. Um, I mean, I feel lazy if I don't work hard in a day. I, I find it hard to have a day off, like properly a day off. Like I try to take Mondays off now. I'm out of office on my email on a Monday. But I've been here with you today. I've done, you know, an interview on the radio. There's a Zoom ongoing. There's a, there's a Zoom I'm going to do afterwards. I have to interrupt the interview. You're multitasking. Well, yeah, all the time. Because, yeah. I, because I'm radio, newspaper, television, Zoom, internet site, blah, blah, blah. And that, I, I often tell myself there's a reason why you're doing well in the industry in here. Because you have to keep up that work rate. It's a... It's, it's a, it's, there's no algorithm for boxing, there's no, or fight sports, there's no, there's no, um, there's no schedule, there's no fixture list, is there? It's, it's random and it can be off because someone's, you know, got an injury or things haven't worked out or someone's tested positive for a, for a banned substance or whatever it be. Um, my daily struggles. I just try and keep in a rhythm of things. I don't, I try and leave my day as open as possible. I, I, I've got a diary, I keep to my diary. But I, I'm, I think I'm very blessed, you know, in that, that, that as long as I um, stay focused on what I'm doing, work is my friend. And it was my friend in the dark days as well, because I've such a passion for it. It helped me get through in through the loneliness. I mean, during COVID, I pruned a lot of friends, and I I spent a lot of time on my own. You know, I mean, I live out in the countryside, and I think there were seven weeks when I didn't see anyone at one point. Um, when the weather's warm, I just went paddleboarding. I did a lot of things on my own. I had a lot of transformations during COVID in terms of learning to be on my own. Um, which, which is a really important thing, learning canonical ownership of your life, not having to lean on other people to do things, to be truly independent. Um, and had it not been for COVID, I don't think I would have learned that because that was enforced on me. I, I grew a lot during that time and I really knew who my friends were. Um, I knew who I felt good towards because we're often pulled... Um, you know, in lots of different directions. You know, our phones dominate our lives now. Um, you know, I try to put my phone away for a little bit of time during the day when I'm doing my exercise. I don't want to look at my phone, you know. Um, I don't know if I'm answering a question here, but I, I'm searching for daily struggles. I think, I suppose, deep down in myself, it's that thing about what have you really achieved, you know? Um, are you achieving enough? I'd like to do some documentaries. I'm starting to work on documentaries I want to put on my own YouTube channel. I want to branch outside fight sports. I don't want to be one of those 
look at me, I'm a great observer on the world, like a Joe Rogan or a, or a Jordan Peterson. Or a, the, the, I mean, I think they're fascinating people. But I don't want to be... I'd rather do give kind of a helpful stuff and wisdom to people I meet in my own meandering experience. But I, I'm fascinated to make documentaries on my feet. And so if there's one thing that that I struggle with. I do get depressed every now and again, but I go and exercise as soon as I feel it. Go and exercise, go and get out. Um, and I drink quite a lot of tequila as well, which I probably shouldn't do. That probably doesn't help, but I do love a bit of tequila. I think we all know that. Um, tell me about a time where you were having to fight back tears. Do you fight them back? No. I don't cry that much. I cry, I cry out of emotion a lot. I can have been... I can have been... I could have been paddle boarding in Cambridge on the rivers in an afternoon and I'm listening to, you know, Bruce, Strings, Bruce Springsteen, um, you know, Streets of Philadelphia or, um, you know, a great track and the sun's going down and I can be, I can just have loads of tears of joy in that moment, to feel blessed to be alive, you know, feel so happy to be alive. I'm quite an emotional person, but I think when things are very sad, I tend to not um, be tearful about it, um, but I, I, I'm very good at dealing with a crisis. And I think there aren't tears because I, I, I don't think I cry a lot because going away to school at 10, when you suddenly feel like you're cut from the umbilical cord to boarding school, you, you, you tighten up very quickly and get over it. And, you know, you're in a boarding house with 30 other boys and growing up in that way, and it's Lord of the Flies, it's very tough. It, 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 it didn't feel it at the time, but when you look back, you know, I've probably got a few syndromes from going away, but as I said, I've grown close to my parents as I've got older. Um, and... You, 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 you probably learn to stiff up a lip at school. You know, I was the last person to be caned in my school when I was 16. I used to have things called gatings. I was very, very... What's uh, gatings? Gatings is when you have to get into your military fatigues at lunchtime and run five miles down the riverbank. Um, I, I mean, I did it. You know, um, we, 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 were, we were smacked and caned and when we were little and so it doesn't happen now, but... I look back on it and just think, oh, all it did was toughen me up, you know. Um, but I'm not changed. I'm exactly the same as I was then. I, don't, I believe my spirit will not be daunted or dented, you know. Um, I, I'm a, I am a free spirit, you know. Um, you know, and it, 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 the system's there for a reason. All the systems that people talk about. Um, and I probably, I remember... One of my masters, they were masters, they're called masters at school, you know, sent me a letter at the end saying, I'm not sure whether um, you beat the system or the system beat you, but I wish you well in the future. And I think you know, I probably got away with being me. I mean, you know, I, I was in the first team for cricket when I was 15, 16 and played in the first team for rugby and was very much a part of our captain to school team. And, you know, we were national champions at cricket and big things at the time. But I think what happened was once, once I was in the first team for things, I never got punished anymore, but I was still the same. So it's about, sometimes I think it's about finding your place in society. Um, and I don't, again, to go back to that thing, I feel like I fit in the boxing industry. We're, 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 we're outsiders in a way. We're, we're, there's chances, there's, there's new characters. There are a lot of characters. And I think you, I would say, and then I would just fit in it because we don't fit into the normal parameters of, of, um, of, of you know, an office job or being in a law firm or working in banking or, or working, you know, in the foreign office or in government. Not in the terms of a physical sense, obviously, but where does that fight spirit from you come from? Um, it's in you. And you need to be in situations that you find out about that. Whether it's not needing to sleep for a couple of days because you've got to get something done, um, stamina to get a job done, 
Um, you learn it in, in, in sporting environments, whether you've got it or not, whether you never give up, whether you've got that fighting spirit. A lot of young men found it in the world wars, didn't they? They were heroic. We don't have a lot of opportunities to be heroic today. People show it in different ways. Um, showing empathy for other people um, and doing things for other people, I think, often shows that fighting spirit. Um, I'll never give in. I'll never give in. But you can learn to back out facing to fight another day. Um, I think you learn that as you get older. You can just back out facing. You don't have to turn around and back out facing uh, and live to fight another day. And keep your honour intact. Um, I think it's in you. And I think, you know, um, you know, I've got a couple of little grandchildren now and, and um, I, I just love watching them. And I don't see them that often, but I just love watching, sitting back and watching their little spirits. Um, I think it's, I, I, I think if you challenge yourself enough, you're going to find out. You are going to find out. Dealing with nerves, dealing with um, performance, dealing with adversity. Um, if you don't face it, you're never going to know. Um, but, you know, li life is beautiful. Life is, is a mystery for me. Um, and the joy of breathing in and out, the joy of being alive. I was on a bike ride yesterday, and do you know what gave me great joy? Suddenly the birds were chattering because the sun was out, and I saw the first snowdrops. And, like, you can miss little details if you're too caught up in things. Um... And, you know, you only learn that if you're being present. And I think you only, you're only present if, you, if, if you're aware of being alive in that way, you know? Treasure the people around you. Treasure the people you love. That's all part of fighting spirit for me and being there for other people when they need you. Um, you know, we're all fighting in different ways. I, I had to be a fighter to overcome my heart attack. I remember John Fury telling me about that. We were having a long chat one night. I said, oh, I'm not a fighter. And he was like, no, because I told him the story about the heart attack. You know, and, and um, no, I think I took wisdom from that. There's a lot of people who are fighting things all the time. And I think there's people in a hurry behind you in their car. Just let them go. Let them go. Don't get wound up by it. There's pe People have got fights that they're not showing all the time. You have. You know, um, we're a little bit closer now after this interview today, aren't we? Um, you know, we've, we've all got a fight going on within. They're just different. They're, it's, it's on a different place in the spectrum. And it's moving all the time and evolving. You know, I might have the biggest fight of my life going on inside my body right now. You know, I've got diabetes. I've had a heart attack. I've got little things wrong with my body. Uh, I don't really like taking medicine. Um... But I think the mental fight is often harder than the, than the physical fight in, in, in many ways. And that's, that's very topical at the moment, isn't it? Do you find you're still having to fight demons in your life? Do you have demons? Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to say we all do? Yeah, we've all got some demons. Otherwise, we'd be perfect, you know. Mm. But I think you, but those demons are there because you need to work on yourself. You need to work on yourself. Um, and if you're not working on yourself, you're not evolving. You've got to evolve. There's different stages of life. As you get older, you've got more time on your hands. And it's how you use that time for other people. You get closer to your children or closer to your parents. Reach out more for your friends. Um, and also have more time to do the things you really want to do to achieve those things. You know, I've got a little sa sailing boat. I want to go across the... I, want to go, I don't want to go around the world on it. That's a bit much. But I want to go across the channel. Um, I want to learn to sail it. Um, you know, 20 hours there and back. Um, I want to make some significant documentaries to leave behind. Um, leave a legacy for my children and my grandchildren. Um, 
because that, that's all, all wanting to leave them comfortable. It's not just about money, but you want them to know that you love them and that you put things in place for them. Gareth, George Grove said something to me a couple of weeks ago. He mm. said that his dad used to say something to him, or, or still does, and his dad used to say, which, and I said I say this sometimes, but I'm not really sure, sure what I'm saying. His dad says to, says to him, be happy. What does that mean, be happy? Is that an instruction or is that advice? Well, I think it's about making the most of it, isn't it? Don't look at what you've got, not what you haven't got. Look at maybe the things you've done and the things you can do rather than the things you can't do. I mean, part of my career, I mean, I've done, it's my eighth Paralympic Games for the Telegraph and TV as well, um, and radio on, uh, in, in Paris 2024. And I've always been inspired by the disability sport movement, the Paralympic movement. It was called disability sport when I started in 1996. So it stayed with me. I, I'm, I'm very proud. It's some of my proudest work, by the way. I've won three Oscars, the, the, the sporting Oscars for... For, for, for writing about that and broadcasting on that with the Telegraph, Sunday Telegraph. Very proud of that because it's fashionable now, but it wasn't when I first started doing it. And being around people, I remember having at the Paralympic Games having like 10 new heroes a day, you didn't even know their names, be it Bosnian one-legged volleyball players bouncing up past you in the stadium, you know, um, swimmers with no arms and legs, you know, having these inspiring stories. And that, to me... Um, you can't daunt or dent a spirit. You can take accidents, the limbs, there's so many amazing stories. You can, the 3,500 athletes at the Paralympic Games, you can close your eyes and pin a tail on a donkey on any name and there's a story there. And human beings are extraordinary people and, and I think what George's dad is saying there is Look at what you are. Look at what you've done. Make the most of yourself. Um, happy. You need to be sad. You need to be down to be happy because you can't have one without the other. In in my view, in the in the balance of things. So you've got to take both. You've got to take both. You, there, there's going to be times of sadness. There's going to be times of great mourning. There's going to be times of grief. There's going to be times of anger. But on the other side of that spectrum, there's going to be times of extreme happiness and, 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 and joy and love. And they're all there. You can't have one without the other. Um, but, um, you know, I remember speaking to the Klitschko's, by the way, last year on a Zoom around about May time. And obviously, you, like you, I've been around them a lot in the career. And they were, they were in Kiev in their bunker. I remember Vladimir saying to me, you don't know till it all changes like that, what can happen in life. And obviously they're still fighting a cause. I think they're extremely heroic in what they're doing. I think they will gain global acclaim for what they've done, more than what they ever did in boxing. So just make the most of it, because you just don't know when it's going to change. Life's a lottery ticket. So um, well done, George Groves, Dad. I think he's right. There was, it just reminded me of um, a clip, I'm sure you would have seen it, um, of Will Smith. Uh, whatever it was last year, and he said that um, on that night at whichever ceremony it was, it was the Oscars or the, the Grammys or whatever, he said Denzel Washington had said to him that um, be careful because the devil comes for you at your highest point, um, which is very dark, but it seems to be very true. You reap what you sow. You definitely reap what you sow. But be yourself. Uh, it's a weird one, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, when you're flying, when something's gone really well for you, it's good when you get that little voice saying, calm down, calm, enjoy it, calm down. You've only just done that, you know? Yes, acclaim. F fame is a weird thing. I mean, in the tiny, tiny bit of it that I've experienced from, you know, from our industry, it's a tiny bit of fame, you know, because you're, you're recognised or whatever. You, I wouldn't want too much of it. Ditto with money. You wouldn't want too much of either of it because they don't lead you anywhere. They, they, lead, they draw your ego out. And we're all egotists in a certain way. We're all narcissists on a certain scale. Everyone, I mean everyone. But, you know, 
for whatever I achieve, I'm not, I'm not a woman in a children's home bringing up 20 children who've got no parents who need that love, you know? Love is so important. Um, that's why our children have to be so important, what we give them, how we commit to them, you know? And it never stops. It never stops. Um, and I think that's what that speaks to in a way. And it's funny, isn't it? You, you, read the signs is what that's saying. Read the signs. He just said that to him, and then look what happens on stage. You know? Um, sometimes we do things that, bang, we get caught. I had a couple of instances. I had one the other day. Every now and again, I have one where someone's like on you and like, whoa, that's escalated. Um, and you, you, sometimes you cannot get out of it. You've got to do what your spirit is telling you to do. And that's what happened to him that day, you know? It, because cause emotionally, emotionally, there are journeys that he's on with his wife, who's his, probably his greatest friend, and, you know? Um, sometimes you just can't get out of it. But it's another, it's just part of our test, isn't it? You think those things happen. Emotion is an extraordinary thing. We have our emotions. We have our love. It's what we have as human beings. We, we wouldn't be human otherwise. So, yeah, it's, it's, you're going to get drawn sometimes. And it's how you respond in that moment that, that dictates, you know, how you feel afterwards. He probably has great remorse about slapping that guy, yeah? But... It's in public as well. It's the most public thing. But we, we have things that happen behind the scenes as well. But if you have... I believe that right is might. And if you... Even, even if it's very daunting to get into a situation that you've got to do because you've been drawn into it in that moment, whatever it is, you've got to be in it. Be in that moment. Without causing violence or egregious harm or whatever it, it be. But... you. you it, if your spirit is telling you to do it, you need to do it. You touched on this um, earlier in this podcast. You talked about not or having suffered depression into your 50s. Is mm. that something that is currently still with you? Have you learned to deal with that aspect of your life? I had a day recently when I was so depressed. It creeps up on you. I woke up with it. I don't know why. Um, we don't know why sometimes. It could be something in your body. It could be something metaphysical. Um, I just think you've got to deal with it. And what I've learned to do is just deal with it. Just deal with it. Just be with it. Sit with it. Um, my parents are a great source of sucker. My girl is a great source of sucker in those situations. Um... But sometimes when you just deal with it yourself, when you know it's there, it's much more powerful. I, I, I put music on that day and went for a bike ride. It didn't go completely. Um, but then well, what it is, it gets you to search inside yourself. Or maybe it's a sign of something. It makes me reach out to other people and see if other people are okay sometimes. Um, you know, I'm a natural communicator, so I love to talk, as you can tell. Um, but it's... Mental health is a broad term for a lot of different things now. And it's very vogue and it's talked about a lot and it's an excuse for things sometimes. But it's just where we are in that day, in that moment, in that place, in our lives. And it won't stay there forever. And if it stays there forever, you probably end up you know, being very unwell. But you have to find ways to fight it. Do the things that make you feel good, you know. Um, whether that be helping other people or helping yourself or exercising and all those other things. That's what I do. Something I spoke to Leon McKenzie about just last week, about how much of an issue uh, or a problem is depression within boxing, specifically with the boxers, because that's not spoken about. Tyson Fury, obviously, and Leon McKenzie, obviously Leon McKenzie across two sports, so he's talking about his, yeah. his time, very open about... Uh, anxiety, depression, suicide, Leon has been for several years. Tyson Fury, you know, we know how vocal he has been. But aside from that, do you think there is a problem within our sport amongst the boxers that doesn't get spoken about? You just reminded me now that there was a time 
when I wasn't happy to live anymore. There was a period. Um, I remember my daughters saying to me, no, 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 we, we want you around. Because I said to them, I'm leaving you plenty. Um, and I remember my parents just listening and not judging me on it, which looking back was phenomenal. Um, it's okay to think about it. It's, Is it? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's okay to think about it. We, 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 we come into this life, we're going to go out. We, we, that's, it's, it's for certain that we're going out. Where we go, I don't know. You know? Um, I believe in... I believe in good over evil. I believe in good over bad. None of us are perfect anyway. But it's okay to contemplate those things. But I think what's tough is when you've got no one to talk to about it. Or when you aren't able to open the portals and speak about it. Because people will, people who've been there or people who love you will say, it's fine, just think about it. Talk to me when you need to. Um, it gets better. It, time heals things. There is clinical depression that some people never get out of, of course. And they go around in circles and they always need help and those things. But in the fight industry, and you know, as Leon, in, obviously from the football industry, alcohol used to be a great problem for those guys in football. I think in boxing, it's, 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 it's twofold. One is giving up the sport and the highs and lows. And the second one is whether you're affected by head injuries at all or blows to the head as you get older. Um, and, and, and whether, whether, you're, whether you're, your mental health suffers as a reason for that. It's so important to talk. And, I, and you know, I mean, I've been on radio this morning talking about it. Um, you know, it, I think it's important that there is a, an outreach program for Xboxes, whether it's done through uh, a stipend paid to the Boxing Board of Control or an authority that's linked to them or with the sanctioning bodies. I think it is important. It's a big gap. A boxers' union is a big gap in, in, in fight sports, frankly, because you do need aftercare. Um, and we see it. We see it when we're around boxers in their 60s and 70s, when we go to a boxing writer's dinner or, uh, every year or go to, to reunions. You know, you, you just don't want to see people stranded on their own as an island out there because we are all connected. We're all connected. Again, not in terms of like a, a physical aspect. I know you know in what context I mean these questions in, but you fight for yourself, you know, you fight for your um, your peers to a certain degree, your family, your kids, grandkids now, but who, who fights for you? Who's in Gareth A. Davis' corner uh, at <sighs> any, any point? We've all got them, we've all got them people, we should have them people. Who's in your corner of life? Outside family and... Whoever it is. Do you know, it's funny as you were saying that, I was thinking, no, no one, because I have to fight for me. If the day I stop fighting for me is the day that I will regret, because my parents love me, my children love me. I love my children, I love my parents, but fighting for me, no. I'm an independent in that way, you know. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an individualist, I'm not in a group. Um, that's what I feel. Um, Only one person on this podcast, sorry to stop you. Only one person on this podcast has answered this question in the same context as what you're saying. Who's that? Can you guess? Ray Winston? No. No. Um, Eddie Hearn? Yeah. Wow. Well, maybe we're ma both massive egotist narcissists then. No, I'm just kidding, Eddie. In fact, I'm seeing Eddie very soon. Um, y you've got to... I have great self-belief. I'll tell you that. I have great self-belief. I know because I have not reached out enough in my life to other people. I've done it as I've got older. I never, I never needed the support of my parents till I was much older in life. And, you know... I mean, in terms of asking their advice on things, and who fights for me? I don't feel like people do. I don't. I, don't, I genuinely don't. I think I, 
always think, what have I got to offer, not what have they got to offer me, you know? So everyone I work for, fighters who, whose lives I interview them about or, or talk about or, you know, I think I'm very positive about fighters. I, I have great empathy for them. Empathy is one of the great qualities you have to have in doing what we do. You know, yes, you need to just dig people a little bit for answers sometimes, but... I think my girlfriend would fight for me, but... Um, I can't, I, can't I, I don't think other people fight for me. I, do, I don't... Sometimes people have come out and supported me when I've needed it, but I asked them for that support. Weirdly, I think, because, and I don't know this, but from the outside in, people go, oh, no, he's fine. He can take the, the piss being taken out of him, or he's fine, he's always on the go. He's, he's fine, he's always busy, he's always doing well, he's, everything he does is growing. And No, I can't, I, I can't think of anyone that fights for me. I, I don't mind that either. But, you know, when I get old and frail... Maybe uh, I, might need a, I might need a little legion of, of uh, fighters for my cause, but who knows? Who knows? But, you know, the, the, I think destiny and the universe fights for me, if I can get, get a bit hippie about it, because I am so lucky. I'm so lucky in the way I look out in the, on the world. I'm so lucky. I'm so privileged to have travelled so many places, to be given the upbringing I've got, to be able to speak different languages, to have, like, to tell myself, even though I'm in a job where you make judgments, not to try and judge people, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the comparison, I mean, I, I made with Eddie Hearn when I said it was the, in the same context, he's the only person that referred to himself uh, in that context. He, what he was saying, what you're saying, were actually two different things because you were kind of thinking about actually who does fight for me. His answer was similar to yours uh, in terms of you have to like basically fight for yourself in life. So that was the similarity between your answers, but that was it, yeah. But you don't, I agree with that. I mean, he's, a ve he's talking about being driven, isn't he? About being driven. He's a very driven individual. Um, and I think fight is how you encapsulate what you mean by fight there. You know, um, you know, I'm not fighting for my rights. I'm, I'm, I'm doing for my life. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the things I love doing. I make a living from them. Um, obviously, I'm accepted in the industry. I wouldn't be here otherwise. You know, we get access to people. People see the value in you, but in one day they won't see the value in you, you know. So I'm developing my life alongside that, which is piano and paddle boarding and cycling and being outdoors and, you know, involving, evolving my, my, my family life and um, doing the things that I know I'll have to do one day because it won't all be here where I'm not taken up by it mm. the whole time. But... Um, I only fight when I have to defend my corner, and, and I don't, and I do, I do. I mean, I wish I did, wasn't so, um, I can be quick to rise sometimes, you know. If, it, if it's the right thing in, at the right time, like I was saying to you before, where you suddenly get taken by this situation. And it's like, no, I'm not accepting this, you know. I've seen a couple of snippets of that version of Gareth. Yeah. I have. I know you have, Vegas, the Vegas, media room. Vegas, yes. We both have in Vegas. Yeah. Um, go That's on. down to tiredness, and you work. The thing is, you, you you play for you work for fourteen hours a day in Vegas. You sleep for four, and you play for four, or something like that. You know, and you go and gamble or whatever you do. No, it's it, those those fight weeks are are, are, are brilliant, but you Dra can a little bit draining at times. Yeah, they're draining, but but no, it's it's just it's it's heightened emotion. And also, I want to win in those weeks. I'm doing radio, newspaper, television recordings. I want to fucking win. I want to be on top of every story, um, 
And, you know, sometimes you can't give your time as much as people want it. Okay, last one. What drives that fight within you? What is the factors that contribute to that fight that you need to push yourself for? They're not amazing qualities because I think they're qualities that lead you into conflict because they're pride, competitiveness, desire to stay. I say at the top, you know what I mean, but be, be, be relevant in our industry. You mean in terms of work? Well, in terms of your life or work. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just, you know, I think there's a synergy there between the two and, you know, wanting to be successful, wanting to keep your lifestyle up. Um, I think it's pride and, and, um, and competitiveness. A hint you of know, ego? Which, oh, yeah, of course. You can't have an ego. You can't not have an ego. Oh, I agree. Totally. Everybody's got Everybody an ego. Everybody has. Everyone's yeah. got an ego. Ego's not a bad word for no. me. Ego means I am in Latin. Yeah. Ego is screaming out at the joy of being on a fucking paddleboard on the estuary sometimes. Yeah, I agree. Off Kenvey, where I've been out for five hours on the board. That's fucking ego as well. Um, but I don't, I, I know in our industry, I know it's about the fighters, but it's a sport of opinions. And when you've been doing it long enough, you know what, how the industry works. You know how the algorithm of fighters is. You know about the silhouettes moving together and the styles making the fights. You're never, you're never always right, but you have to give an opinion. You have to give your view on it. And also, you, 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 you can say I'm going here with my heart, but I'm going here with my head. It doesn't mean you dislike anyone or you want them to lose. I, like, I never bet on fights. I never bet on fights. Because it doesn't, common sense, I don't want it to shade my judgment on what the fight is. I don't, and nor do I with my picks. I don't want my pick to be right. Well, I mean, I mean, it's great if it is, but if there's an upset, phenomenal, you know. But but it, but, and also, I've learned over the years, it's so hard to interview a fighter when they've lost sometimes, that because their, their spirit is shrunken for a moment. Such an amazing thing when people put their spirit and their body on the line uh, for a fight in front of everyone, say on a date, a time, a weight in a certain place. It's an amazing thing. They are the true gladiators. It's a primeval thing. And, and, and to go back to the original thing, ego, they couldn't do that without ego. There were so many reasons for doing that. And you can use your ego in a really good way as well. I mean, it, it, um, which is to be on, to be in the moment, to be part of it all. You know what I mean? Those fight weeks when you're just, you're just on. And your radar is up. You know, when you're spotting people to interview and you know your questioning is right and you get beautiful things out of it and people, things that people enjoy. It's an entertainment industry at the end of the day, but it's a very fucking brutal one, really brutal industry, um, very cruel industry. Um, and that's why we need to care about our fighters. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Um, Gareth, appreciate your time. I do know that since you've been here, you've done at least three different other aspects of your work. <laughs> and we've had a good catch up. Oh, yeah. Um, I do appreciate it. I really thought this, um, this talk today, would I'd find it um, quite satisfying and informative. So I'm sure people will, because to touch on our original point from the first couple of minutes of this podcast um, as long as I've known you I'd say 80% of the stuff that you were talking about today I didn't know oh, okay that's good so that is the purpose for me to do these and I'm sure if I didn't know there's a good chance 80% of people out there wouldn't know that either well maybe I should interview you for your own podcast okay. in that chair coming up with very similar questions I, I, I might do that for myself one day not yet because obviously series 2 this my is ego isn't series that one, big yet to put myself on my own <laughs> podcast but uh, if I do decide to do that yeah actually I think you would be the right person to do that yeah one. I'd love to do it for you um, the, the, I, I will say as well um, you know um, Regardless of a couple of little bumps we've ever had, which have been, again, as the things we talk about, we've always got an extremely well. We've always had 
I think, a symbiosis around sport, knowing how the others work and getting how the others work. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Hopefully we know each other a little bit better now anyway. I'm sure we have. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, like a couple of bumps in the road. But quickly forgotten about. I remember there's one, one in the top rank office once. Me and you had a blowout over who was going to interview Tyson Fury first. Oh, I'm always like that about in fight week. Like this is not this was like Fury's first fight in Vegas when he fought um, Schwartz. Schwartz or Valin? Oh no! What was this row? This was something along the lines of you don't remember in the top rank office. No, I don't remember when I'm in that mode. I think one of us stormed out. I can't remember which one it was. No, no, I wouldn't have stormed out. Did I storm out? Anyway. Are you recording? Yeah, it's recording. Okay. Of course it's recording. Um, this is 2020, is it? No. No, earlier. Earlier. 2019, before COVID. Possibly. Okay, before COVID, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember what it was. But anyway, it was quickly forgotten about within minutes. Yeah. And then you come and hijack my Wayne Rooney interview the other day. That's not a bad track record, like two instances which were... No. The, the, I mean, look, the top rank one, I can't even remember it. Because I'm in a particular mode. I don't remember everything about it. Fight week is the fighting spirit within. Definitely. Definitely. Because you want to be first. You want to get the best stuff. You want to be on top of everything. And I can be doing, in a Tyson Fury fight, I can be doing BBC News, Al Jazeera, Talk Sport, Telegraph, Pitch Boxing, William Hill. Uh, Have I mentioned Talk Sport? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm across so many platforms. So it's like, I'm like... That Monday interview is very crucial. I cannot even remember it, but what you got in before me, did you? No, I think I was meant to go to interview Tyson. Yeah. And you swooped in ahead of me. I think I went to his house that night as well. Whichever. But anyway, that's It's a bit competitive now. Look, you got it you started getting it. <laughs> I can't really remember it. I just remember like me going, <laughs> that fucking Gareth, that fucking Gareth. Uh, but yeah, it was quickly forgotten about within minutes, and uh, I think in 12 years, I think, yeah, it's probably like one of... You've got to let things go. We haven't had anything serious happen between us. You've got to let these kind of things go. I, you know, it, it's... Competition is healthy. Yeah. You haven't done too badly, have you? No. I've learned, listen, that's the thing as you get older and you've been doing whatever, that patience factor. Mm-hmm. But now it's a case of like, even what you were referring to the other day with Wayne, it's almost like... Okay, like, because my stuff with Wayne can, like, was, is pre-recorded for, like, the next day. You're obviously... Live on air with the TalkSport microphone yes. and we've got a live show. No, and, 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 and... I get that. I get that. I thought, genuinely, you were just finishing the interview, but you just started it. Did you, uh, started. Did you put it out on the I channel? I put it out, yeah. How long was it? Uh, two and a half minutes about or something. Less than, less than two minutes. Well, I do apologise. I will reach out to Wayne. No, it's fine. <laughs> it really is fine. <laughs> Gareth, appreciate your time. Um, guys, thank you very much for listening to Raw of the Fight Within. Um, we will catch you next week. Make sure you comment, like and subscribe. Gareth Davies, A Davies, uh, thank you for your time. Pleasure. Be kind. I'm going to share something with you. That might put me in a very negative light, yeah. Relationships are not my forte. You see if someone grabbed up my wife for saying completely different ball game. I'll walk away from here and this has been like a therapy session.